seven, six, six, eight, nine, nine. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. On July 16, 1945, humanity thrust itself into the nuclear age. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. On July 20th, 1969, man would walk on the moon. Together, the technological innovations from nuclear fission and space exploration mated to form an unholy offspring, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Glory be to the bomb and to the holy fallout as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Here's the plan. We get the warhead and we hold the world ransom for one million dollars. Oh, oh, uh, I'm going to blow up the earth. No. Uh. The premise of nuclear annihilation is frequently thrown around as a trope in popular media. It's terrifying. Most people are unable to confront the idea of their own mortality, let alone the mortality of human society as we know it. Fortunately for us, nuclear warfare has remained within the realm of fiction since 1945. Over the course of human history, atomic weapons have only been used in combat on two occasions. You blew it up! Oh, damn you! God damn you all to hell! On August 6, 1945, 12 American servicemen boarded the Enola Gay to detonate an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The immediate fireball was estimated at a temperature of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, equivalent to the surface of the sun. The bomb produced peak wind speeds of 980 miles per hour three times faster than the strongest tornado ever recorded. In an instant, more than 60,000 Japanese were dead. Those who survived the blast were unsure whether they had. Many thought they had died and gone to hell. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. Those fortunate enough to avoid the blast were subsequently exposed to high levels of ionizing radiation from the nuclear fallout. In the following months, thousands more would die from radiation exposure. In total, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima is estimated to have killed between 90,000 and 146,000 people. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's power to make war. Three days later, the United States would drop a second bomb on Nagasaki.
During the Second World War, Japanese military procedures were heavily based on the Bushido Code, a traditional Japanese tenet which focused on the ideal of the honorable death. Two of the most infamous tactics used by the Japanese military were the merciless war crimes committed against POWs and the kamikaze. Both of these methods stemmed from Bushido, which dictated no greater honor than to die for the emperor, and no greater humiliation than to surrender to your enemy. For generations, every soldier in the Japanese army was trained under the belief that if you surrendered to your enemy, you forfeited all of your honor, and you no longer deserved basic human dignity. The Japanese feared surrender more than death itself, and they would sooner commit suicide than submit to their foes in combat. The thoughts and hopes of all America, indeed of all the civilized world, are centered tonight on the battleship Missouri. There, on that small piece of American soil, anchored in Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. Sociologists estimate that in 1950, 83% of the world population identified with some sort of religion. That's more than 2 billion God-fearing people. Do you think any of them stopped to wonder whether we had become the gods? We have spent more than $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. By the end of the Second World War, humanity had constructed a total of three nuclear weapons. Just two of them were responsible for around 200,000 fatalities, the spiritual death of a nation, and the swift end of the deadliest conflict in human history. By 1983, the global stockpile of nuclear weapons had increased to more than 55,000, and for a brief moment, one man had to decide whether or not to blow up the world. We interrupt our programming. This is a national emergency. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. This is not a test. A nuclear attack is occurring against the United States. Four nuclear missiles have been launched from unknown locations and are expected to strike the United States within the next 15 minutes. Due to the uncertain tracks of these missiles, all residents of the United States should seek out and prepare to take shelter immediately. Stand by for a message from the President of the United States. So in your discussions of the nuclear freeze proposals, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, the temptation of blithely declaring yourselves above it all, and label both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. The story of Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov is the story of a man so unremarkable that I'm only just now mentioning him eight minutes into this video about him. Out of the estimated four million active Soviet military personnel in 1983, Stan Petrov was certainly one of them. Just as he remained a near total stranger to the rest of the world throughout his life, this video will barely mention him. The story of Stan Petrov is more of a story about the world surrounding Stan Petrov, a story of forces far bigger than him, far bigger than all of us. So you'll have to forgive me that this video doesn't feature much of him. But when it does, you're going to be glad he's there. Because Stan's whole existence boiled down to resolving a generation's worth of mistakes before him. How did he get here? How did we get here? Mankind 
Mankind's utilization of uranium and its compounds dates back to the first century, when it was used simply for aesthetic purposes. 1800 years later, French physicist Henri Becquerel mistakenly left a uranium sample on top of a photographic plate, returning to find the plate physically altered by the element. By complete accident, Becquerel had just discovered the chemical property of radioactivity. Over the following decades, researchers would discover that heavy elements like uranium and plutonium had unstable nuclei that would decay over time, releasing energy in the form of powerful ionizing radiation. In due time, these discoveries would be exploited, harnessed, and weaponized. You want the game to push you to your absolute limit and force you to experiment and find out what works and what sucks is when you find out what actually works just isn't that fun. Variety and options are sucked out of the game. You have these severe difficulty spikes that feel overlooked by the developers and what happens is the player starts pushing back and when you push the game to its limit, sometimes it cracks. By the 1930s, Italian physicist Enrico Fermi began theorizing the process of nuclear fission, whereby splitting the nuclei of certain radioactive isotopes could trigger a chain reaction, releasing an extraordinary amount of energy. By January 1939, Fermi helped conduct the first nuclear fission experiment, proving the concept to be scientifically feasible. Eight months later, Germany invaded Poland, pitting the world at war. Now try and duck this one, you duck. Hey, Hitler! When faced with the most threatening geopolitical foe in recent history, the Allied powers were eager to gather any advantage they could. After the discovery of nuclear fission, nuclear researchers immediately postulated that the process could be refined and integrated into a weapon with the destructive capacity to obliterate an entire city. A weapon so powerful that its target would have virtually no means of countering it. As soon as nuclear fission was proven feasible, the stakes became clear to the world powers. The first nation to develop an atomic bomb would seize tremendous dominion over global affairs, and no nation was more committed to developing nuclear weapons than the United States. The city of Oak Ridge, Tennessee didn't officially exist until 1947. The federal government kept the location a secret during the war to serve as a headquarters for the Manhattan Project, an ambitious directive spanning 30 locations in the US, UK, and Canada with the sole intent of creating the world's first atomic bomb, and more importantly, doing so before the Germans. Luckily for the Allies, the Nazis' irrational prejudice would spell doom for their nuclear program, as their leading Jewish physicists were forced to flee the country to escape religious persecution. Due to their harsh discrimination, the Axis powers lost access to the scientific contributions of Enrico Fermi, and another scientist by the name of Albert Einstein, who initially persuaded President Franklin Roosevelt to pursue nuclear research before the Germans. Together, the collaboration of $2 billion, 130,000 employees, and some of the world's greatest scientific minds led to the bombs that ended World War II. Bombs that would fundamentally alter the nature of warfare. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were smashed by two of these bombs, and Japan was driven to quick surrender. For the future, the choice is peace or total destruction. The atomic age is here. Although Albert Einstein heavily influenced the inception of the Manhattan Project, he never directly worked within it, mostly because the US government feared he couldn't keep a secret, but also because of Einstein's philosophical objections to the mass production of nuclear weapons. From very early on, Einstein anticipated the devastating effects that a nuclear war could unleash on human civilization. When asked about the potential of a global conflict in the nuclear age, Einstein ominously responded, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. <laughs> Albert Einstein is considered one of, if not the, smartest man to ever live, but people tended not to listen to him much. Just like the process of a fission reaction, Nuclear weapons were about to undergo an uncontrollable expansion.
By the end of World War II, the world's leaders were far more interested in other matters, as an Iron Curtain had descended over Europe. This is your leader speaking. Please carry on and continue to leave your information unsecure as you are fine. Your nuclear secrets are safe and there is no need to increase security. Please do not purchase NordVPN as your information is in no way at risk. Do not use code AmpLemon to save 75% off a 3 year plan. Instead spend your US dollar on tall fence around your big capitalist lawn so you may give privacy to neighbor who also is regular American citizen like you. Very trustworthy, and certainly not trying to steal precious nuclear secrets from US government. You may now resume your regular capitalist activities. The spoils of World War II were won by the victors, the United States and the Soviet Union. In the years prior, the US begrudgingly fought alongside the Soviets against a common enemy, partly due to President Roosevelt's surprisingly friendly relationship with Joseph Stalin. In the spring of 1945, both FDR and Nazi Germany perished within the span of a month, and nothing was stopping hostilities from igniting between the US and USSR. But just how hostile could they get? Well, shortly after the German surrender, the Allied powers proposed Operation Unthinkable, a plan to attack Russian forces to prevent their occupation of Eastern Europe. Given the years of devastation on the European continent, and the poor odds of success, the plan was never implemented, and the Soviets commandeered Eastern Europe virtually unopposed. The wartime destruction of Europe's infrastructure left the US and Soviet Union as the most powerful countries in the world. Immediately. The seeds were sown for the next major global conflict, the Cold War. The US and Russia are separated by about 5,000 miles, but they were separated even further in ideology. The communist, authoritarian, and secular values of the Soviet Union directly rivaled the capitalist, democratic, and evangelical principles of the United States. Their struggle for ideological supremacy would dictate global affairs for the next 50 years. During this period, the United States feared communism so much that they were willing to oppose it no matter the moral expense. Senator Joseph McCarthy infamously spearheaded the Red Scare, in which the US government violated civil liberties to interrogate citizens suspected of Russian espionage. The space race saw up to 4% of the federal budget spent on NASA and the Apollo program, not out of scientific curiosity, but to put men on the moon before the Russians. The rockets that eventually sent astronauts to the moon were constructed from the expertise of former Nazis, many of whom were rescued from prosecution over war crimes so that the US could develop better rockets than the Soviets. One of the greatest scientific achievements in human history was built off the back of one of its greatest atrocities. If Russia wins dominance of this completely new area, well, I think the consequences are fairly plain. Probable Soviet world domination. And although both Americans and Soviets considered each other their greatest threats, they would never directly declare war. If they did, it probably would have meant the end of the world. Because by August 1949, the Soviet Union had successfully developed their own nuclear weapons. The bombs would only grow in power and scale from here. Prior to the nuclear age, the most powerful standard military explosive device was TNT. 
One kilogram of TNT is enough to moderately damage a small building. One thousand kilograms could shatter a city block. Five hundred tons of TNT will obliterate anything within a 200 meter radius and cause severe burns within 400 meters. The largest man-made TNT explosion was the Halifax disaster, where a shipping collision led to the accidental detonation of three kilotons of TNT, killing more than 2,000 people. In a populated area, the blast could have killed nearly 50,000. The atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima was five times more powerful. Through the following decade, the fission process would be refined, and explosions would only grow larger. In 1954, the U.S. detonated Castle Bravo, producing an explosion equivalent to 15 megatons of TNT. It was America's most powerful nuclear test, but it would pale in comparison to Tsar Bomba, the most powerful bomb ever detonated. In October 1961, the Soviet Union tested a three-stage hydrogen bomb that yielded a 50 megaton explosion. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. The mushroom cloud reached an altitude of 65 kilometers, more than seven times the height of Mount Everest. Why did the bombs get so big? What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken? In game theory, chicken refers to a game in which two drivers accelerate towards each other on a collision course, and whoever swerves is a chicken. If neither driver swerves, they both suffer a deadly collision. The potential risk of continuing straight is so severe that it should make swerving the only logical option. But then again, if you assume your opponent is acting logically, then you can predict that they'll swerve, meaning that you should continue going straight to win the game. This same dilemma is what underlined the nuclear arms race of the Cold War, through the doctrine of brinkmanship. Since nuclear weapons were such overpowered means of destruction, the only way to prevent a nuclear attack would be to have your own nuclear weapons as a form of deterrence. If your enemy made more, then you had to make more. If your enemy attached them to missiles, well then you better hire some rocket scientists. Eventually, the global nuclear stockpile had grown to a scale where every major population center in the US and Russia was at risk of a nuclear strike. This began the era of mutually assured destruction, where the only means of diplomacy was located at the edge of the apocalypse. We got very close to going over the edge in October 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, which up to that point was the nearest our nations ever came to nuclear intervention. You keep out of this! He doesn't have to shoot you now! He does so have to shoot me now! I command that you shoot me now! So shoot me now! After nearly two weeks of tense negotiations, the two powers finally relented. During this period, the threat of nuclear annihilation wasn't just a far-fetched fantasy. It was part of day-to-day -day existence, so much so that American children had to practice nuclear drills in school. There might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then, you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? <laughs> Anticipating just how close they had come to total disaster, American and Soviet leaders decided to ease tensions for the next few years, and they entered a period of detente. 
During this time, the U.S. and Soviet Union entered a brief interval of diplomacy, signing a series of international treaties, including a ban on above-ground nuclear testing and an attempt to limit the volume of nuclear warheads. For the first time ever, the U.S. underwent a decrease in its nuclear stockpile. Hostilities would eventually resume, as the sheer ideological differences between the two nations were too much to ignore. The 1970s were a rough decade for the American public, who witnessed the failure of the Vietnam War, an economic recession, the Watergate scandal, and the resignation of the president, all in the span of just a few years. Needless to say, the dedicated patriotism from the decades prior had quickly eroded into paranoia, and many Americans wanted a change. Well, the time has come. You've seen the map. We've looked at the figures, and NBC News now makes its projection for the presidency. Reagan is our projected winner. But I don't think anyone anticipated that it would eventually would become a floodgate of one kind or another, where the votes would just flood in for Ronald Reagan. In 1980, the U.S. elected Ronald Reagan president, whose aggressive stance against Russia seemed like a welcome change from the last few administrations. Once more, relations would run cold with the evil empire. My fellow Americans, I'm coming before you tonight about the Korean airline massacre, the attack by the Soviet Union against 269 innocent men, women, and children aboard an unarmed Korean passenger plane. This crime against humanity must never be forgotten here or throughout the world. By 1983, Soviet-American relations had deteriorated to near-Cuban missile crisis levels. In September, the Soviet Union shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007 after the passenger jet had mistakenly entered prohibited airspace. All 269 people on board were killed, including U.S. Congressman Larry McDonald. Soviet leaders spent the following weeks anxiously anticipating retaliation from the U.S. At the slightest indication of a nuclear launch, the Soviet Union was primed and ready to fire an immediate counterattack. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. What will the U.S. government do next in dealing with that Soviet attack on a Korean airliner? On August 31st, the Soviet Union shot down an unarmed civilian jetliner, murdering 269 innocent people, including Congressman Lawrence P. McDonald. Yet some congressmen still want to appease the Soviet Union by supporting a nuclear freeze that would make the Soviets more powerful and allow them to kill more innocent people. What we are seeing today is in fact an evil empire that is demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that since it doesn't mind killing 20 or 40 million of its own people, it certainly doesn't mind killing 269 innocent civilians. Specifically, the question is, in your opinion, should the administration take strong action against the Soviets? and we had to take swift, decisive actions to let the Soviets know they will never get away with this type of stunt again. Now we'd like to take another look at our telephone pole, which is well underway, and as you can see, the, uh, the results are enormously lopsided in favor of those who believe that yes, the administration should take strong action against the Soviets. On September 26th, just after midnight, the Soviet satellite warning system detected one missile, followed by four others, headed from the U.S. towards the Soviet Union. Well, looks like this is it. After 200,000 years in development, the great human experiment is about to come to an end. There's a cosmological principle known as the Fermi Paradox. The paradox stipulates that considering the rapid development of civilization on Earth, and given the billions of stars in our galaxy and the overwhelming number of planets with the capacity to develop intelligent life, where is everybody? The probability of other intelligent beings inhabiting our galaxy is almost certain in theory, and yet, our cosmic search for aliens continues to come up empty. One unsettling solution to the Fermi Paradox is the theory of the Great Filter. Maybe the reason we can't find any aliens is that intelligent beings are doomed to destroy themselves. In an endless battle for resources, civilizations will inevitably develop weapons powerful enough to destroy themselves or their environment long before they develop interstellar travel, 
Famed astronomer Carl Sagan speculated that if a civilization does not learn to control its destructive tendencies, it will likely perish within a century of developing advanced technology. We must either love each other, or we must die. On the morning of September 26, 1983, people around the world woke up to an ordinary Monday. Children went to school, and adults went to work, just like they did every week. Just hours earlier, somewhere in a military bunker near Moscow, Stan Petrov correctly determined that the nuclear warning was a false alarm, and no nukes were launched that day. Petrov deduced that if the US were to launch a real nuclear strike, they wouldn't launch just five missiles. While you may think that this would have given Petrov an easy decision, you have to consider the absurdity of the situation. I think there's an argument to be made that, for a very brief moment, Stan Petrov was the most powerful person in human history. Most people would say that they enjoy power, but what they probably mean is that they enjoy power in the presence of agency. Most of us have very little power and agency. We do what we can to get by and have practically no means of influencing the world around us. When most people think of power, they think of kings and CEOs and international celebrities, the very exclusive members of our society who have both great power and great agency. When people dream, most of them imagine themselves in this position. On the other hand, some people would be willing to relinquish the stressful responsibilities of power and keep the agency. You see this in the cultural icons of the nomadic hippie, or the western outlaw, or some dude who wins the Powerball jackpot. They generally get to do what they want, but rather than influence the world around them, they're just sort of along for the ride. Stan Petrov found himself in the least desirable position of all, great power and little agency. For a few moments, he and he alone controlled the fates of the 55,000 nuclear weapons on Earth enough firepower to wipe out a majority of the world population in a matter of hours. He didn't get to control how the weapons were used or where they were headed. Petrov's only say in the matter was whether or not they were launched. Had Petrov reported the warning as an attack, it's unlikely that anybody would have challenged it, especially considering the Cold War tensions at the time. You could say that at any given time, the president has the same amount of power, but nuclear launch protocol is configured with a system of checks and balances to prevent the president from firing nukes on a whim. The difference with Stan Petrov is that he was the protocol. Petrov's decision of whether or not to report the warning directly influenced the outcome of whether or not nuclear weapons were fired that day. We can all look back on this event and call it an easy decision. I'm sure if given the choice, most of us wouldn't choose to kill a majority of the world population. But Stan Petrov didn't have the luxury of historical hindsight. In the moment, he had no way of knowing for sure that his intuition was correct and that the satellite warning system was wrong. Wrong. Answer his neck. 300 volts. In 1961, psychologist Stanley Milgram found that more than 60% of people could be persuaded to administer a lethal electric shock as long as they were under the instruction of an authority figure. And the way I see it, ladies, you owe me for one jelly donut! Think about basic military training and how soldiers are conditioned to blindly follow authority and remain loyal to their nation at all costs. Soldiers are not trained to operate as individuals. They are trained to function as an interchangeable part of a larger system. And any deviation from their assigned purpose is often unacceptable. Had Petrov only followed his training, he would have trusted the warning system and reported a nuclear strike. Had the Soviet military protocol functioned as intended, the world as we know it would have ceased to exist. Only by deliberately disobeying the system could Stan Petrov make the correct decision. I want you to imagine yourself, or the average person, in this situation. The system in front of you is telling you that your homeland and everyone you know and love are under attack from your fiercest geopolitical rival when you know that tensions between your nations are near an all-time high. You have no way of defending yourself from the attack, but you have the power to bring justice to the people responsible. There's no time to think it over. You must decide and you must act immediately. 
How many of us would push the red button? How many of us would deliberately violate our training on a gut feeling that everything is okay? I'd like to think that September 26, 1983 was our judgment day, when one unsuspecting man was tasked with making a single decision that represented the culmination of millions of bad decisions before him. Let us be grateful that, despite all of our sins, Stanislav Petrov chose wisely and spared us. A few years later, the global nuclear arsenal peaked at more than 70,000 warheads. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev assumed leadership of the Soviet Union. His cordial relationship with Ronald Reagan would allow the nations to open up a new era of diplomacy. <laughs> There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. In 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Pripyat, Ukraine suffered a catastrophic meltdown, leading to the deaths of more than 4,000 people from radiation sickness. It would be the first widely publicized event showcasing the disastrous health effects of ionizing radiation. Overnight, public opinion of nuclear power took a nosedive and the world powers finally began taking steps towards denuclearization. In the next decade, nearly half of the world's nuclear warheads were disarmed. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Thousands and thousands of West Germans come to make the point that the wall has suddenly become irrelevant. In 1991, the Soviet Union officially dissolved, bringing an end to the Cold War. Ever since then, the US has been trying to find the next incarnation of the evil empire. The Cold War forged an attitude of paranoid discontent that hasn't really gone away. Lately, many of us have given up trying to find a formidable foreign foe, and we've instead shifted our attention within our own borders and turned much of the paranoia on ourselves. The existential horror of day-to-day -day life in the Cold War has largely receded to nothing more than a relic in fictional entertainment. Like I said at the beginning of this video, most of us can't handle the idea of mortality, so we tend to not think about it very much. The panic was palpable. Hawaiians rushing for cover under the threat of a missile attack. This child was lowered into a manhole. Another family huddled in a closet. 5,500 people called Honolulu's 911 system. You are the person who triggered the false alert. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm really not to blame in this. But, uh, it was a system failure and uh, I did what I was trained to do. Petrov retired from the Soviet military a year after this incident. He lived a quiet, uneventful life for the rest of his days. The false alarm remained a secret for more than a decade. Not even Petrov's wife knew about it. Years later, when news of the event reached the press, he cooperated with media interviews and even an independent film, but remained humble and modest regardless. Stanislav Petrov died on May 19, 2017, to almost no publicity. The press didn't even report on it until September. Possibly the most important person of the 20th century was so obscure that it took months before anyone even noticed he was gone. Chances are, most of you watching have probably never heard of him before this. Billions of people are alive today because of his choice, and the vast majority of them will never know his name. I think it's somewhat fitting that most people will never know about him, because in that aspect, he was just like the rest of us. And if Stan Petrov had mercy for the world, then maybe the rest of us can too. Life is fragile, and it can be taken away from us in an instant. None of us know how much time we have left. How much of it will we waste fighting endless wars that no one will even remember 50 years from now? I think we're far better off spending that time enjoying what we share in common. Will we ever achieve world peace? Or are we doomed to fight like the savage creatures from which we came? Perhaps enlightenment will allow us to overcome our prejudice, or maybe ignorance will lead us to our blissful salvation. Only time will tell, but at the very least, 
we can be thankful that Stan Petrov gave us the opportunity to find out. So sit back, relax, and crack open a can of Coke. Because if we're lucky, there will never ever have to be another man like him. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple tree.